the Fab Lab Digital Daycare, a very special live stream with me, Crazy Aunt Lindsay. I am so excited to see you today. I missed you all weekend long and I have been busy like a bumblebee trying to figure out what cool projects we're gonna make this week and I think you're gonna like everything that we have in store so make sure you are checking it out. I need you to know a couple of things. First of all, this awesome live stream is brought to you in collaboration with my dear, dear friend, Nisha from Fajika Lab at MIT in Boston. So hey to you, I hope your live stream went great this morning. The next thing I wanna tell you about are my awesome sponsors. Two, not one, but just amazing Portland local female founded businesses, Living Room Realty for giving us a home here uh, for the Fab Lab, as well as Rain, the growth agency, our awesome, awesome, awesome media partner. Thank you to you too. I am so excited to be here with you and I can't wait, cannot wait to show you what we have coming next. I'm super excited for this next project. It's one of my absolute favorite ones to do ever, ever, ever. I still secretly do it sometimes as an adult, so I know that you guys out there are going to absolutely love it. So if you have not already done this, run to the kitchen or to the bathroom, grab just a couple of things. You should have seen the list while we were waiting, but I'll tell you what to grab. A little bit of baking soda, a little bit of vinegar, and some sandwich baggies. Then go wa wash your hands before or after. Actually, wash your hands first. Go grab those things and then meet me back right here. In the meantime, I'm gonna introduce you to my awesome friend, Logan, my friend, Dr. Nancy's adorable son. He's going to hook us up with a little hand washing tutorial while you run and go get those supplies and I wash my hands. I'll see you back in a second. Hey, Logan. A way to wash your hands. Alrighty guys, welcome back. I hope your hands are squeaky clean like mine and Logan's. Thank you again to Dr. Nancy for giving us permission to show Logan's awesome hand washing skills. So good, so thorough. Alrighty, so right before the hand washing break, I let you know that we're going to need a couple of important things for today's project. First of all, sandwich baggies. So if you have a sandwich baggie, open it up. Shake it out, okay. I have a couple sandwich baggies here. And then I want you to grab a tissue. If you have been using your tissues properly, as in <coughs> coughing into them and achoo, sneezing into them, then you have one handy. Cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to lay our tissue down on our board, on our, on our counter. Now you must be thinking to yourself, Crazy Aunt Lindsay, what the heck? is a tissue and a sandwich baggie going to be? And I'm going to tell you. So, one of my favorite things to do when I was a kid was make chemical reactions. Really safe ones that I could do really easily with my parents' permission. All you need for today's chemical reaction are two things. Baking soda, which you probably have, ugh, super heavy, this is like 13 pounds which you probably have in your refrigerator or under your sink in a little box, baking soda, and Old Faithful distilled white vinegar. If you don't have distilled white vinegar, but you have um, champagne vinegar, which is kind of fancy, so don't use that, 
or apple cider vinegar, which is in a lot of uh, cupboards, you can grab that. You can use white distilled vinegar, which is perfect for this project. It's very inexpensive uh, and has a lot of uses. And baking soda. Now, Crazy Aunt Lindsay, what are we gonna do with the baking soda and vinegar? Oh, I have a feeling that you might know. So the first thing we're gonna do is make Fab Lab Sink Bombs. Yes, I said Fab Lab Sink Bombs. So what you're gonna need for this is a measuring spoon, or you can just use your eye. Grab a couple of teaspoons of baking soda. Here's one teaspoon, and here's another teaspoon. This is just my recipe, but you can eyeball it. It doesn't need to be perfect at all. So I'm gonna set that aside. And now you're gonna wrap up your tissue, your tissue full of baking soda, like a little burrito. And if you were watching last week, and you saw our Fab Lab tortilla wraps, then you already know how to make a little burrito. So fold up your tissue with the baking soda inside and set it aside. The next thing you're going to do is take your sandwich bag with a zip top. You wanna to make sure it's going, to, it's going to zip nice and tight. Now that you've done your little Ziploc test, you're gonna open your bag back up and then you're going to take vinegar and you're going to pour in about, well, just less than half full of vinegar. Do this over the sink if you are home alone. Or just do it over the sink, or outside. Outside's a good place, but we're gonna do the sink today. So just shy of half full with baking soda. And then, or excuse me, with, with vinegar. And now vinegar has a special name. Does anybody know the special name of vinegar? <gasps> Astic acid. So this is Astic acid, the scientific name for vinegar. And you're gonna close your sandwich bag, just almost closed, so that there's like a little hole on the side for you to put in your baking soda. Does anybody know the scientific name for baking soda? No worries, I'll tell you. Sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate. What you're gonna do is you're gonna quickly stuff in your sodium bicarbonate into your sandwich bag and close it up super fast and then run to the sink or run outside or go outside and do it or run to the sink and do it there. Okay, now you're gonna drop it in, close it up super fast and give it a shake. And the next thing you're gonna do is drop it in the sink. One more time. <laughs> Alrighty guys, if you're following along with me, please make sure you are in the kitchen or in the bathroom in the bathtub or outside. It's not raining too bad. It's not raining yet here in Portland. It's a little cloudy. So if you're in Portland, head outside and do this project on the front lawn. <laughs> or not on the front lawn, on the sidewalk. Because this project does have the power to kill grass. And I'll tell you more about that in a second. So I'm gonna grab my second sandwich bag and I'm going to make my baking soda burrito. So I'm gonna lay that down. I'm gonna grab my measuring spoon. I had a little leftover from the first go round. And I'm gonna do one, <laughs> two teaspoons. Yep, teaspoons. Lay that aside. And I'm gonna make my little burrito, my little burrito bowl and I'm gonna set it aside. And then I'm going to do about a quarter full of vinegar, or who remembers the scientific name for vinegar? If you said astic acid, you are correct. So I'm gonna do about a quarter full of my astic acid, AKA vinegar. And then I'm going to close up my bag just so there's a little corner peeking open on the side. 
And then I'm going to drop in my baking soda burrito and close it up super fast. Give it a shake. Give it a shake. And then pass it under the sink. projects ever. And you must be thinking to yourself, whoa, Crazy Aunt Lindsay, what the heck just happened in there? And I am going to tell you. Whenever you combine an acid and a base, you produce a gas. With acetic acid or vinegar and baking soda, which is our base, sodium bicarbonate, when you combine those two things, a gas called carbon dioxide is created. Carbon dioxide is also something that's created when you breathe in and out. What you breathe out is carbon dioxide. That's the same kind of gas. So trees, plants, eats up all the carbon dioxide and emits oxygen. That's why human beings and plants are amazing to live together. They work together. We produce food for them and they provide air for us. So in this particular case, the sodium bicarbonate, excuse me, the, uh, <laughs> the carbon dioxide, <laughs> It, it expands because gas wants to fly all over the place, but we created a container for it that it didn't have anywhere to escape from. And when things have pressure and no way to escape, what do they do? A kablooey! They explode. And that's exactly what happened with this awesome project. Now, what we've ended up doing with the result of our project, our baking soda and vinegar solution and gas, we ended up using to clean out our sink. Baking soda is an awesome light abrasive that helps to exfoliate both our skin and helps things like pots, grease, things like that to come up off of surfaces. The same thing with uh, vinegar. Vinegar is an incredible deodorizer. If you have mold in your bathtub or in your sink, it'll help to kill the mold and it'll help to deodorize. So you combine those two things together, not only do you have a little bit of an explosion, but you have an awesome cleaning bomb. I don't know. <laughs> so we're going to use, that was a chemistry lesson, and we're going to use a similar chemistry lesson, but with slightly different ingredients to make even more powerful, uh, make, make an even more powerful cleaning project. I'm going to introduce you to my very special Fab Lab DI Sci dishwasher and toilet bowl blasters. Are you guys ready for this? Now, if you have these ingredients on hand, I want you to run and grab them. If you don't, it's okay, because this very episode is going to be available for you on replay on YouTube, and you can make them for yourself later with your family. So we're going to use baking soda again, not vinegar this time. 
we're going to use a different acid. So does anyone remember what the name, the scientific name for vinegar is? Astic acid. For this project, we're going to use a crystallized, a crystallized acid called citric acid. And I'm going to show you in the overhead. Now citric acid can be used as a preservative. If you're thinking to yourself, crazy Aunt Lindsay, where in the world do I find citric acid? Well, if your parents are into canning or jarring fruit and preserves, you'll be able to find this in your canning and jarring, jarring section at any grocery store next to the mason jars. Uh, you can also find this in the bulk section of most health food stores. Citric acid is found in lemons and limes. It's actually what, it's actually, citric acid is the actual um, tangy sour taste that you get in citrus, citrus fruits. So it's all natural, it's very easy to find, it's very safe in moderation. So we're going to put this aside and I'm going to grab a Fab Lab bowl right here. And I'm gonna get some measuring spoons. Oh, for this project, you're also going to need, in addition to your baking soda, ooh, big heavy bag, and your citric acid, you're also going to need a little bit of either dish soap, dishwashing soap, or I'm using Castile soap. I'm just using plain old all natural Castile soap that I use for everything. I use this for my body. I use this to wash my dishes. I sometimes, once I was in a pinch and used it as a laundry detergent and not kidding, it was amazing. So a little bit of Castile soap. Okay, so what you're gonna do for this project is you're going to open up your baking soda and you're going to put a cup of baking soda in a bowl. Just set this aside right over here. Okay, and then next is going to be my citric acid. I'm going to close this up and put this to the side. This is my baking soda off to the side. And next is my citric acid. Again, super easy to find in your canning sections of any grocery store. And you'll need a quarter cup of this. Now, this, as I said, is an acid. And because it's not a liquid and it's not quite activated yet, when I put this acid in with my baking soda, my powdered baking soda or sodium bicarbonate, it's not going to react right away. So I'm gonna use a quarter cup of citric acid and I'm gonna put it right into my baking soda. I'm gonna close up my citric acid and put that to the side. Then I'm going to mix up my dry ingredients so they're nice and combined. Set those off to the side a little bit. Okay. So my dry ingredients are nice and combined. Awesome. And then next, I'm gonna add, oops, a little bit of Castile soap. I'm gonna add about two tablespoons. Now I could use my measuring spoons, but I'm just gonna eyeball it. If you're not good at eyeballing, then definitely use your measuring spoons. And I'm not gonna add too much and I'm gonna be very gentle with it. Now that's about, that's a little bit less than a tablespoon. I'll just start there. And I'm gonna mix it up and see if this combines well. Okay. Okay. Definitely going to add a little bit more. That was definitely a tablespoon. So I'm combining my citric acid, my quarter cup of citric acid, and my full cup of baking soda, and my just about two tablespoons of Castile soap, but again, you could totally use dishwashing detergent. This is still kind of dry, so I'm gonna do two things. One, I'm gonna add a little bit more Castile soap, but I'm also going to fragrance this. The Castile soap that I'm using is fragrance-free. Sometimes you can find it in fragrances, whatever you like. Mine is fragrance-free. But I have some awesome citrus-flavored 
essences, essential oils. I've got lemon, I've got orange, I have grapefruit and tangerine. Let's see, I think I'm gonna go with an orange grapefruit lemon combo. You know what, I'm gonna go with all of them. I'm gonna add a few drops of all of them, just just because I'm feeling extra fancy. Awesome, that's about three drops of the orange, of the grapefruit. Then I'm gonna add a couple of drops of the orange. Oh, the colors are so cool. I don't know if you can see it in the overhead shot, but this is the orange. This one is the grapefruit. They're just such pretty colors in the bowl. Gives me the idea to maybe add a little food coloring. Maybe I won't have to. A little bit of tangerine. Awesome. And some lemon, just to finish it off. Again, our citric acid is found in all of these citrus fruits. Citric acid, citrus fruit. Hmm. Cool. And now I'm gonna add just a little bit more of my Castile soap. Just a little bit more, because I really want this to be damp. I don't want my mixture to be wet at all. I just want it to be damp. Okay. I may even need to add a little bit more for good measure. Actually, before I add anything else to it, I'm gonna do the pinch test. If you've ever made bath bombs with me, which is totally an episode you can find on the Fab Lab YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the Fab Lab HQ, then you know all about the pinch test. The pinch test just lets you know if it's moist enough to stay together. So let's see. Oh, this is almost perfect. This might actually be perfect, but I wanna, oh yeah, this is perfect. So normally, I should have done this before I started. Normally it'll just kinda of crumble if you lift up the citric acid and the baking soda, but in this case, I'm pinching it and it's staying together just a little, just, just, just perfectly. So it's not wet, it's just moist. And I think that this is gonna be just fine. The next thing I'm going to do is make like I said, my Fab Lab blasters, my dishwasher and toilet bowl blasters. So I'm gonna just keep pressing this a little bit more. And I'm either going to grab an ice tray, a cookie mold. I just so happen to have, oh, these are, this is so dusty. I just happen to have <laughs> um, tins. I have mini muffin tins. I'm gonna rinse them out in the sink really fast just because they, it's been sitting up in my cupboard for a while. I really only use this for my bath bombs. So I'm just gonna rinse all the dust out and dry it a little bit. I'm gonna dry it, dry it, dry it like so. I can actually do this over here. So I'm just gonna dry this really fast because my muffin tins were a little dusty, which is totally okay, because I'm only going to use these today, not for muffins, but for my Fab Lab DIY dishwashing and toilet bowl blasters. Okay. And I wanna get all the water out because I'm using two chemicals, my sodium bicarbonate, and my citric acid, and they will react if they get touched with a little water. Just the way you saw in the sink just a moment ago, when my lunch blaster exploded in the sink, it'll be a semi-similar experience that I wanna save for the toilet. <laughs> okay, so this works out fine. This is just fine. I'm gonna lay my towel down just to protect my paper. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to Mix this up a little bit more because it started to settle, which is totally fine. You can smell it, it smells so wonderful. And actually I'm gonna teach you wafting, a very scientific way to smell something. You hold it away from your face, and as you breathe in, you fan the fragrance toward you. You don't really wanna put your face over open chemicals. These are safe household chemicals, but just for the future. Okay. So I'm gonna get a little bit of help from my quarter cup, and I'm going to start to pack 
my muffin tins with my mixture. And I'm gonna start pressing it in. Now this is why you wanna do the, the pinch test. Because if you can see, it's not wet at all. And I can just get it in there really, really good. Awesome. So I'm gonna just fill my muffin tins. Again, you can use a cookie tin. You can use uh, an ice tray. If you have any of those really cool um, like silicone ice trays that are in the shapes of flowers or dinosaurs, you can use those. This, there's, there's no proper way to shape a Fab Lab toilet dishwashing blaster. <laughs> the cooler it is, the fancier it is, the better. You know how we do here in the Fab Lab. Alrighty guys. So I am just pouring and pressing. Are you guys pouring and pressing with me? I'm just pouring and I'm pressing until I fill up my entire muffin tin with my baking soda and citric acid mixture for our awesome DSI dishwasher and toilet bowl blasters. This is a great way to stay excited about doing chores at home. As many of you know, your parents are working from home right now. You guys are home from school right now. And parents, I'm gonna tell you the truth. They need all the help that they can get. So this is a really, really special way to help your parents around the house by cleaning up things that you probably don't normally really think about unless you're like me and my mom. When I was growing up, we had a chore chart. Would you like a Fab Lab chore chart? We had one in our home and it actually made chores pretty fun. My mom would put stars on it. Sometimes when she remembered, she would always forget to put stars on our, char on our chore chart. But I didn't mind. So we're just filling up our muffin tins with our Fab Lab mixture of baking soda and citric acid and a few drops of citrus scented essential oils. Today we used all of the essential oils that I had. I had tangerine, I had a grapefruit fragrance, I had, oh what else did I have? I had orange, I had lemon, but you can use any fragrance that you like. If you'd like to use, you know, like bay leaf or anise seed or lavender even. We talked about lavender last week and how uh, anti-stressing it can be uh, when it comes to aromatherapy. Really anything that you have on hand. And you don't have to add fragrance. This will clean perfectly without it. Okay, I've got just enough probably for a half a bath half a bomb, half a blaster. So I'm gonna just see what I can do. I'm gonna shake the rest right on in. And then I'm gonna press. Okay. So that one cup, one and a quarter cup, one cup of baking soda and a quarter cup of citric acid plus a little bit of Castile soap. I might have used about three tablespoons of Castile soap, but you should, you, you're gonna wanna eyeball it. Sometimes it can be a little finicky. So I'm going to take this and I'm gonna let this dry for anywhere from four hours to 24 hours, so right overnight. Um, not even necessarily 24 hours. These will set up really, really nicely. Now we're gonna come, when I see you tomorrow, we're gonna package these up and we're gonna give them as gifts to our neighbors and friends. But for now, we're gonna let these dry. I'm gonna clean up here and get ready for, I think you know what's next. Oh, Fab Lab Active Hour. I'm so excited to introduce you to my new friend, Fab
Fab Lovers. My name is Chelsea Ray, and today we're going to do some springtime yoga to calm the heart and plant a seed of peace in our soul. I first want to start off class with doing a little bit of a talk about yoga and also a breathing exercise. I just want to remind you all that yoga does not mean to touch your toes. It doesn't mean to take some crazy shape. Yoga means to join, right? So just by joining in, to do yoga with me today without even doing any breathing or any poses, we're already accomplishing yoga, right? Joining our breath with our movement to create peace in our hearts and joining each other all around the world. This amazing practice is what yoga is all about. And during this time uh, in life, right? There's a lot of things that we're not sure about. There's a lot of things going on. Adults are talking about things that might make us feel a little bit of anxiety or fear. And I just wanna remind you that fear is an emotion that keeps you safe, right? So we don't need to get hard on ourselves for being scared or nervous. It's totally fine. Fear is the emotion that keeps us from getting in trouble, right? It, it's something that we notice in our body and then we say, wait, am I really in danger right now? Do I really need to worry right now? Sometimes maybe yes, but for the most part, no, right? So we use yoga to accomplishing, to accomplish squishing out fear, right? Because we don't want fear to stifle our confidence, our courage, or our calmness. And so that being said, I would like to do a little breathing exercise that helps us maybe calm down our, our heart and our mind and allows us to not let fear take over, okay? So we're gonna do something called alternate nostril breathing. What alternate nostril breathing does is it actually works for uh, calming down our nervous system. That's what activates, that's what gives us that anxiety, that tightness on our chest, right? So we do alternate, alternate nostril breathing to get a little bit more peaceful inside. So we're gonna take the oxygen in through one nostril, hold it at the top, and then let the oxygen out the other nostril. All right, you wanna join with me? Okay, first things first, plug your nose, right? Can we plug our nose and make a funny little sound? <laughs> All right, so our nose is plugged. We're gonna open one nostril and close our mouth. Take an inhale, close your nostril, exhale out the other side. Good. Inhale, close that nostril, open up the other nostril, let the breath out. Inhale through that side, close it, exhale out the other. Inhale, Close it off, exhale, good. Just a few more rounds through the nose. Close it, hold it tight. Exhale out the other side. Inhale. Close it off, exhale out the other side, good. One last time. Breathe in. Close it. Exhale, let it go. Right, and then bring your hands to the tops of your legs. All together, let's take one big breath of air through the nose, through both nostrils, fill up. Poof your belly up like a big balloon and then exhale, sigh it out your mouth. So anytime you feel fear and then you really think about it and say, do I need to be fearful right now? Am I safe? Yes. Am I, am I nervous? Yes, and that's okay. Right? Maybe I need to do some breathing exercises. So you can do alternate nostril breathing anywhere you're at, any time of the day. Right? So put that in your back pocket, save it for later. Another thing I'm gonna to talk to you guys about is a word called mantra. A mantra is a positive word or saying that we repeat to ourselves over and over. And so I want you to think about a positive word that you can repeat over and over. Maybe that's courage, maybe it's calmness, maybe it's confidence. Maybe it's hope, peace, love, or joy. I'm gonna choose, hmm, I'm gonna choose happiness, just happiness. 
right? And that's a word that you can come back to, or you can say, I am happy, I am calm, I am happy, I am calm. Anytime you're in yoga class and your mind is like wandering all around and you can't focus, you can repeat your own specific mantra, right? So let's make it to our mats, right? Just before we do, I want you to put your mantra into a seed, like a little seed from a flower. Right? I have my seed right here. Can you hold up your seed? Yep, my seed's purple. And my seed and my mantra, happiness, right? I am happy, I am calm. I'm gonna take that seed and I'm gonna swallow it. And it's gonna go down, down, down. So I want you to take your seed, whatever color it is, whatever shape, swallow it down. Imagine it going down, down, down into your heart. And we're gonna plant it there, right? And we're gonna cover our heart with one hand and then the other, plant that seed, close your eyes, think of your word, happiness, calm, hope, peace, courage, whatever it is. And I want you to take that to your mat and lie down on your back. I'll meet you there. Okay, get all settled in to our first pose do nothing pose. Lie down, wiggle your body around from side to side, get really comfy in your mat, spread your arms, spread your legs out. Close your eyes and start to take deep breaths in and out through your nose. And continue to take these deep breaths and imagine in your mind's eye, somewhere outside, somewhere in nature, maybe, maybe a meadow or a forest, maybe a mountain. You can even imagine a place you've already been, like your backyard or a garden of some sort. And as you lie here on your back, feel the soft grass underneath your feet. Notice the sky and the color of blue that it is. Maybe your sky is purple or pink. And just really imagine the most beautiful place in nature that you can think. Might be trees there, maybe some animal friends start to come in. Like you might see a bird in the sky or a little frog might hop by. Just observing everything that you imagine in your mind. And then coming back to the heart space where we planted our seed, our mantra of positivity. And imagine that you have another one of those seeds that you're gonna plant here in this garden or the meadow or the forest, wherever it is that you imagine. And you can think of a new positive word or maybe it's the same one, maybe it came from the same flower as the seed in your heart. And bringing it with you into this space Start to open your eyes, still imagining that you're in this beautiful, magical place. Wiggle your fingers, wiggle your toes. Maybe it's the morning time in your magic space. Maybe it's the afternoon or early evening. Maybe it's even night. And wherever you are right now, Bring your knees into your chest. Make yourself that little baby seed of positivity. You are courage, you are strength. And rock from side to side. Make yourself the tiniest little seed you can. Squeeze your knees into your chest, good. And then start to pump your legs. Rock and roll your seed up to a seat. Really nice, you guys. You can rock back a couple times, maybe four or five times if you're having fun with it. Feel your spine massaging down into the mat. And then you rock yourself up to a seat. Bring your hands to the floor, cross your ankles. 
and stand up to the top of your mat. Hands come to your heart. We hope you guys have a wonder-filled garden springtime yoga practice today. Inhale, reach your arms high. Make a big circle with your arms like the sun and thank the sun. Thank you, sun. And then as you exhale, thank the rain. Wiggle your fingers as you come all the way down to the floor. Pitter patter your fingertips onto the mat. Because we have to have sun and rain, right? To make our seed grow. Inhale, arms reach up. Thank you, sun. Make a big circle with your arms. Good. Exhale, forward fold as the rain comes down. Pitter patter all over the ground. And then push your seed down into the earth, into your meadow, wherever you are, your forest. And then we're gonna inhale and reach our arms up. Watch our beautiful tree of peace grow. Hands to your heart. Bring your hands to your hips for a tree pose. I'm gonna spin towards you. You stay where you are. Spin one set of toes to the side. The sole of your foot comes up your leg. Hands come to your heart. Your foot might come below your knee to your calf or above the knee, either way. You choose, be a beautiful tree, grow tall. Maybe your arms reach up as tree branches. You can make a tree branch shape in your arms, any tree branch shape you'd like, good. Hands to your heart, to your hips. Spin your knee forward, plant your tree trunk down. Other side, every time we do a pose in yoga, we have to repeat it on the other side. So bring your foot up to your thigh. Maybe your foot comes below your knee to your calf. That's fine too. That's just as good as if you bring it up to your thigh. Breathe, stand tall. Good at balancing. And if you fall, oh, I fell. If you fall, it's okay. You get right back in the pose. Do not judge it. Be here. Be with yourself. So proud you made it to yoga class today. Bring your hands to your hips. Spin your knee forward. Plant your foot down. Inhale, your arms up high to the ceiling. Make your big sun arms. Exhale, the rain comes down to nourish the plants and the animals. And then as you walk along in your beautiful garden or your meadow, bend your knees because there's a really cool little bench that we're going to sit on so we can observe everything going on. We can take a moment to close our eyes. Take those big breaths in and out. And as we sit on our bench, we see a beautiful little bird. Hop on over to the bird bath next to the bench. Float your arms by your sides like bird wings. Straighten your legs a little bit. Lift your heels. Be a drinking bird. Taking in all that delicious, yummy rainwater out of the bird bath. Good. Again, bench pose. Sit in your bench. Reach your arms up. Hands to your heart. Stay here. Sit your hips a little lower. You can do it. You're so strong. Again, notice your bird right alongside you. Fly your wings. Straighten your legs a little. Lift your heels. And then start to tip your head towards the floor like you're drinking out of that delicious bird bath. Really nice, you guys. Bend your knees one more time. Bench pose. Sit in your bench. Hands to heart. Close your eyes. And then slowly, 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 we sit all the way down. Sit, 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 plop, onto our bum. Our soles of the feet come together and our arms come underneath our legs. So crazy, right? Yoga is awesome because we get to make all these silly shapes with our body, right? This is flower pose. It's another thing that's in our garden or our forest. All kinds of beautiful flowers. Maybe your flowers are purple and pink. Maybe they're blue. And then let your flower petals kind of gently, gently wave in the wind. You can wiggle your fingers. Release your arms from underneath your legs. Grab for your feet. A little butterfly flies by. Butterfly pose. Let your butterfly wings flap up and down. Good. And then another butterfly flies by. Now there's like four or five. And then six or seven, and before you know it, there's all these beautiful butterflies surrounding you, 
reach your other butterfly wings up, reach your arms, and then give yourself a big butterfly hug. Yeah, good job. Reach your butterfly wings out to the side, and then bring them behind your back. Maybe you interlace your fingers behind your back and lift your butterfly chest up towards the ceiling. And then reach your arms up, and exhale, relax your butterfly, let your chest fall over your feet. Close your eyes. Three breaths, let's count them together. That's a, a breath in and out, that's one cycle, okay? We'll count them together for one, two, good, three. All right, and then roll up really slow, hands to your knees, draw your knees in. Just when we thought we've seen so many fun animals already, already a butterfly and a bird, what next? Hop, 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 I just saw Mr. Frog. Mr. Frog came to visit us. Rock up onto the soles of your feet and then hop your feet to the side, bring your hands to your heart, your elbows press into your knees. Make yourself a little frog, ribbit, ribbit. You can even make frog noises if you want. But what else do frogs do, right? What do they do? What do they do most? They hop, they hop around. So let's hop our frog, ready? On the count of three, we're gonna hop up. Ready? One, two, three, hop. Good, and again, one, two, three, hop. Yeah, again, one, two, three, hop. Yes, two more times, one, two, three, Woo! Rip it, rip it. One, two, three. Yeah, and then come back down to your frog pose. So nice, you guys. Whew. I'm really getting a workout here. The cool thing about yoga is we not only get a workout, but we get a work in because it creates peace in our heart and our mind. That's what makes yoga the best. Okay, bring your hands to the mat and then come back down onto your shins, hips to your heels, Make yourself a tiny little bee. Bzzz. Head comes down to the mat. Your knees are together and your arms are along by your sides. Imagine you're a bumblebee flying by, flying through all the butterflies, saying hello. And the butterflies also saying hello back. Let your head rest. Get a hold of your breath. Big inhales and exhales. The next inhale, fill up really big. On the exhale, buzz. Tell you can't buzz anymore. Good. Inhale. Exhale, buzz. One more. Big breath in. Big B breath in. And then a bumblebee buzz. On the breath out, really nice, you guys. Crawl your hands forward and tuck your toes because little puppy dog just started to trot on by. Of course our puppy dog had to come and see what's going on, see what, what beautiful seeds of peace we're planting today. Tuck your toes, send your hips up, and then allow your puppy dog to take a little, a little walk around the forest or the meadow. And then puppies are really playful, right? So they, they, he starts to like jog around and then run around. So just start to pedal your feet, lift them up and down and run around through the garden. Bring your knees to your chest, good. Really getting that heart rate going. Nice, you guys. And then bring your puppy dog paws back. Take a breath in and send your heels a little closer to the mat. Spread your fingers wide. Press the mat away, nice. Then inhale forward. You're gonna bring your shoulders over your wrists, your knees come to the mat. Keep your elbows tight, come all the way down to your belly. Slide back a little bit onto your mat. Just now a gardener snake slithers by, not a scary one, a very nice Mrs. Gardener snake. Press your hips down, lift your chest. Good. You can float your hands right alongside you. 
you little gardener snake, lift your chest, breathe through it. We're almost there. You got it, one more inhale. Exhale, bring one cheek down to the mat. Be really still. Be really quiet so the gardener snake will stay. Will stay. Right, because if we make a lot of noise, it might get scared and run away. Okay, and so if we're really, really quiet, oh my gosh, guess what? Another gardener snake comes. But this one, this one's kind of bigger. Oh my gosh. Okay, be really quiet. We're gonna plant our hands right next to us. Okay, lift your chest like the first little Mr. Baby Gardener Snake and then press your hands down so much it lifts your whole chest, even your knees. You press the tops of your feet down and lift your head up. Be a beautiful Gardener Snake. Maybe you're even rainbow colored. Maybe you're yellow or orange, whatever color it is. Take a breath in and then very quiet very slow we don't want to scare them come back down to the mat good tuck your toes under hips to your heels this one's a lot like bee pose but it's bunny all right we're gonna do bunny pose because mrs bunny just stopped by right she had to come visit frog and butterfly and all the other magical creatures in our in our peaceful heart garden bring your forehead down reach for your heels yeah, good, and then lift your bum up. This is bunny pose, so your head is in the mat, or on the mat, rather. Your bum is lifted up into the air. You can stay here, or if you wanna make bunny ears with your arms, interlace your hands behind you and stretch your arms back. This is just an option. If this does not feel good, don't do it. Release your hands and bring your hands back to your heels. Keep breathing, deep breaths in and out. Release your hands, let your bunny ears flop back down and slowly crawl yourself back up to your puppy pose. This puppy has to come say hello to bunny now, of course. <laughs> Good. And stay here, take a breath in, and then let the breath go. Stick out your tongue, just like a puppy. <sighs> Good, one more time, inhale. And then smile and exhale like a happy puppy. Stick out your tongue. <sighs> let all the air out, really nice, you guys. And come back through to a seat. And shift onto your bum and then come all the way down to your back, lie down, spread your arms, spread your legs out really wide. Draw your knees into your chest, give yourself a big hug, a big squeeze, make yourself like a little roly poly bug, all right, or like your seat, mm -hmm. rolling a little bit from side to side, arms, Go out to this side, let your knees fall over to one side of your mat. Take a little twist. And closing your eyes, imagining your back, of course, in your garden, still there, and your forest or meadow, wherever it is. And gently bring your legs back up through center, your little roly poly bug here. And then to your arms out to the side, let your knees fall over to the other side. legs back up to us to your roly pu roly poly <laughs> bug and then rock and roll a little bit massage that spine one last time squeeze your knees into your chest give yourself a big hug make yourself that tiny little seed and then on the exhale explode into your final rest let your arms let your legs go wide close your eyes Say thank you to your garden, your forest, all the animals that we met today, all the shapes we were able to create in our body. And just remember that you can come back to this place that you imagine at any time, no matter where you are in the world, 
no matter what time of day it is, this is your special place and it's always there for you. So tell the trees, tell the blades of grass, tell all the animals, I'll be back real soon. With closed eyes, start to wiggle your fingers and toes and come back onto your mat. Open your eyes, come into the space that you're in. And slowly bring the soles of your feet to the mat. Come up to a seat, cross your shins, bring your hands to your heart. In yoga, when we finish practice, we say one word that means the light in me bows to the light in you. So I'm gonna bring my prayer hands from my heart to my head and then bow down to each and one of each and every one of you and say namaste. Namaste, you guys. Thank you so much for coming to your yoga mat and for doing yoga with me and growing a beautiful little seed of peace in your heart. things. I've got a tortilla here. I've got a tomato and I have a cucumber. This is a new vegetable in the fab lab. Last week I think we did lots of spinach. We did hummus but I don't think we had any cucumber so I'm super excited about that. So what I'm going to do is take my fab lab knife and I'm going to with the blade pointing away from me. If you are a kid please make sure you have parental supervision which is paramount for kitchen safety and all things safety related. So I have my delicious tortillas here. And I'm just gonna set one aside. Actually, I'm gonna set them both aside because I'm gonna prep all the stuff that I need to go inside of it. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut up my vegetables, which I already washed. Both of my vegetables I've washed already. I'm gonna just slice them very quickly. And then I'm going to slice them. Again, we're going to practice kitchen safety. We want the blade always away from us. We want our fingers tucked and away from the, the blade. And I'm gonna make just like nice thin slices of my cucumber. Not too thin. Sometimes I like to play a little game with myself and see how paper thin I can get my cucumbers or whatever I'm slicing. I'm not terribly good at it just yet. Maybe I'll have somebody come in and teach us official kitchen safety skills and other knife skills in the kitchen. Would you guys like that? Okay, so this should be about enough. This is just less than half of my cucumber. Cucumber smells so delicious. It is super juicy and it helps keep us hydrated because it's got tons of water. Most fruits and vegetables have tons of water in them. So they help us stay nice and hydrated after our workouts. Okay, so I'm going to, with my clean hands, I'm going to collect my sliced cucumber. And then I'm gonna to go to my washed, actually this, I don't know, I can't remember if this is washed or not. I'm gonna just quickly hit it in the sink where all of our lovely goodies from the first segment are still hanging out waiting to get washed. And I'm just going to quickly scrub it with my veggie brush because just like our hands, our fruits and vegetables need to be nice and clean also, 20 to 30 seconds. Awesome. I'm going to rinse it, rinse it, rinse it. Okay. I'm going to dry it just a little bit. Then I'm going to come back over to my cutting board and now I'm ready 
to slice my tomato. Tomato, tomato. How do you like to say tomato? Tomato. Okay, so I'm going to slice it. Remembering my good kitchen skills, my knife skills with tucked fingers. Okay. This should be about enough. Okay, so we've chopped up about half of our cucumber and half of our beautiful tomato. And now we're just gonna slide this out of the way and I'm going to just re-angle that. Okay, now I'm gonna grab a, actually I don't think I even need a plate. It, this is a clean surface. So I'm gonna put this down and I'm going to add, I'm gonna start building my pinwheel. And actually I think I do want, I want a plate, hold on. Okay, grab a plate because I am going to cut in just a bit. So, here is my tortilla, and I'm gonna add any sauce that I want. If you have mayonnaise, mustard, pesto was a big deal last week. We did a lot with, uh, with hummus. If you have any left over, you can use that. I'm gonna try something new. I have a friend who used to hang out with us here in the Fab Lab, my friend Lindsay, who lives in Austin, Texas, and she made this delicious buffalo a buffalo turkey wrap this one time, and this is gonna be kind of inspired by her. And what all she did was she mixed a little bit of mayonnaise and a little bit of buffalo sauce. We have some, some sweet, we have some from Sweet Rays. So that's all I'm gonna do. And actually I'm gonna go grab my mayonnaise. Just because this sauce is a little bit runny. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a little bit runny, and I want it to be a little bit thick. Now, I could, actually, I could. I could and I will. I'm gonna grab a little dish. And I'm going to quickly mix my two condiments. I'm gonna give myself a little shot of mayonnaise, like that. And then for two sandwiches. And just a little shot of my buffalo sauce. I don't think this one is too spicy, but it's perfect for wings. And then I'm gonna mix them. I'm gonna quickly mix them a little bit. Now again, if you just have some pesto, some mayonnaise, if you have barbecue sauce, if you have honey mustard sauce, honey mustard and turkey go deliciously together. I just so happened to be thinking about my friend Lindsay and remembering how delicious that, that treat was. And so that's what I made. I made a little buffalo mayonnaise and I'm just gonna spread it on my tortilla. Just with a spoon. You could use a knife, but we already had a spoon. Why waste? Awesome. So I'm gonna put a little bit on it here flat like this. Spread it all around. Woo! Pretty. Okay, so now I'm just going to flat layer all of my sandwich toppings. Now, if you're vegetarian, you can use any vegetable that you want, avocado, tomato, uh, just any kind of vegetable that you like. I'm going to do a turkey and cheese pinwheel with a little bit of, um, with a little bit of spinach and cucumber. So I'm just going to flat layer my cold cuts. You could do one, or two slices per pinwheel. I'm gonna just do a little bit more than one, just because. And then I'm going to grab some Havarti cheese because Havarti cheese is a delicious. And I'm going to split mine in half and layer it like this. And then I'm going to layer my beautiful cucumbers. And I don't have to use everything that's here, just whatever I like. The cucumber looks really delicious. It smells amazing. And just a little tomato because you know Crazy Aunt Lindsay and her tomatoes. Okay, now all you're going to do is wrap it. Oh, you can add, I did, I did bring some spinach. You don't have to use spinach, you can if you want. You could use lettuce for this, anything you like. Okay, so just a little bit. You can add more or less. And all you're gonna do to make your pinwheel is roll it. I'm gonna roll it this way. All you're going to do is roll it 
tight like this. And if your tortilla is stuck to your surface, either your plate or your table, you're gonna just wanna lift it up a little bit. Okay, so I rolled it up. And now just to help me keep them in place, you can, you can just keep it just like this and you can totally take a bite like that. But I like to make pinwheels. You don't need toothpicks, but I like to use toothpicks to help keep things in place. And so I'm just gonna use a few little toothpicks to help me keep my sandwich in place. Now, it's raining in Portland. Now, I'm going to use my knife to cut sections of my sandwich. Using very, very smart kitchen skills, knife skills. And now I'm just gonna move these to the side and I'm gonna show you how beautiful it looks inside. <gasps> Look at how pretty this is! How pretty are these cute little pinwheels? Awesome! Then I'm gonna just remove my toothpicks. Depending upon how hungry I am or if I'm making my lunch for my siblings or even my parents, I might make a second one. I'm just gonna make one because it's just me right now. I like to hold on to these to the side. I'm gonna just put those to the side. And of course, what delicious pinwheel sandwich would be complete without at least a few chips? So I have some sun chips here. And there you have it, guys. A delicious Fab Lab pinwheel lunch made by you and by me. I'm gonna go eat my lunch and I'll meet you in the community class at 1.30. So go, get, go grab your lunch, wash your hands, clean up anything that you're, you might have uh, used during the, first, uh, during the first segment, and then meet me back here at 1.30 for... I'm Dr. Kiki, and this is my son, Kai. Hi. And we're really excited to talk to your Fab Labbers about space today. Yeah. yeah. So as you can see, Kai has his space hat. He's very into space. You like space, Kai? Yeah. Yeah. What do you have here? What is this? Mm -hmm. this stuffy thing. It's a moon stuffy. Right. So did any of you see the super moon last night? The super moon was huge. You know why they call it a super moon? Do you know why they call it a super moon? Because it, um, it's a part in the orbit. It, because the orbits aren't um, completely circles, they're more of an oval. There are points where the moon is further away, closer. Yeah. And a super moon is when it is at its closest to here. It's at its closest and it's a full moon. Yeah. So when a full moon, you see a full moon, it's the whole circle of the moon. Sphere. A sphere, yes. But when, when we look at it, it looks more like a circle. But that's what's Yeah, and so in our little stuffy here, you can see that there's a face on the stuffy of the moon. Hi, you were saying last night you've never really seen a man in the moon. Yeah, I don't You never saw the man in the moon? Yeah, I can't see that. Well. I see the man in the moon. Do you see the man in the moon when you look at the full moon? Do you? Or do you see something else? I'd love to know what else you see. All right, so I last see night, America. you see South America. I don't know why I see South America. <laughs> okay, so, so last night was a super moon, which means it was a full moon, and like Kai said, it's closest that the moon is coming to the earth. And so it looks really big. And it's not just that it looks big, it really is big in the sky because it's closer. 
What on earth does the moon influence? Um, the tides. Yeah, so the tides, where the rivers come up their banks a little more, a little more when the ocean comes a little further up the beach than normal. High tide and the super tide come with a super moon, so you can get an even higher tide. So the moon is close and it's gravitationally pulling on the water of the earth. This is also another weird theory. I don't really know if it's true, but can somebody please tell me if this is true? But there's um this theory I heard on a on a science um, show documentary. And one of the things they said is that there was a theory that it somehow influences behavior. Like sometimes oh. during the night people um, get like really angry and mean towards each other. Oh. And like or five crap like there's this thing that happens with this one like thing. But like five crimes happen one after another in the night, in the middle of the night. Oh, well you know, that was an idea, but They've actually done scientific studies to find out whether people are crazier when it's a full moon, and they're not. It just depends on what, what time of the week it is, whether it's a weekday or a weekend, whether uh, what time of the year it is, whether it's summertime when, or springtime when people are out more, or whether it's winter when people are staying home a lot more. Um, that has a lot more to do with how much yeah. crime there is than at the full moon. The full moon doesn't make people crazy. Science does not support that. Good. Yeah. It also, science also does not support the idea of werewolves. Okay, let's get into our project. <laughs> so we're talking about the super moon, but I got to thinking about how the moon, how it looked really big last night. Do you know what else is really big? Space. Space is big, and it's a lot bigger than you think it is. It's pretty much infinitely big. It's infinitely big, but let's just start with something that we can maybe think about in our own experience. When you look at the sky, you see the moon at night, um, we see the sun, you're not supposed to look at it directly during the day, and we also have maybe what appear to be these lights in the sky, stars, and planets, and some of the planets are within our very own solar system. And our solar system is a bunch of heavenly bodies, a bunch of rocks and dust and gas in space that orbit around our sun. Do you know why everything orbits around the sun? Because it has the highest amount of gravity and there's nothing else um, close enough to influence their gravity enough to make them orbit. It. Yeah. Okay, so let's think about how where things are and how big they are. Let's think about our solar system. How how many Earths do you think can fit inside the sun? Seventy eight hundred. Seventy eight hundred. No. No. Keep going. No. Keep going up. Up. Seven thousand eight hundred. Keep going up. 1.3 million Earths can, yeah, fit, never can fit inside the sun. 1.3 million of the planet that we live on can fit inside the Earth, or it's fit inside the sun. Isn't that incredible? It's making Kai fall out of his chair. Oh, there he goes. All right, so everyone out there, we're gonna do a little project to talk about how big our solar system is. And to get started, I want everybody to get a piece of paper and whatever pen or crayons or pencils or whatever you might have. And I want you to draw a picture of the solar system, just on one piece of paper. But I want you to kind of imagine how far apart things are and draw the picture. You ready? Okay, so let's start with the sun. You want to do the sun in the middle or wherever <laughs> put the sun somewhere on on your picture okay now let's we know the other planets there's the sun what's the planet closest to the sun mercury mercury okay so we'll make a little mercury and from mercury comes which planet 
Venus. Venus. Venus is the second planet from the sun. It is one of the hottest planets in our solar oh, system. That's okay. Keep going. Oh. Say well, just one piece of paper. It's not a perfectionist show. Okay. Now, what is the third rock from the sun? Earth. Earth. Yes. And do you know which is the smallest planet? It would be Mercury. It is Mercury. It Mercury is, Mercury is the smallest planet. But a while planet. ago, it would have been Pluto. Right, but Pluto's not a planet anymore. It is a a uh, a dwarf planet, I think is what they call it now. Okay, and after Earth Mars. comes Mars. So we'll draw Mars. And then, do you know... Mars and the next planet, there, belt. there is a belt. Our solar system has a belt of rocks, asteroids. Every once in a while, these asteroids come out of the asteroid belt and they come near our planet. And if they come close enough, they can be in our atmosphere and they burn up. And then they're a shooting star. And if they hit the ground, they're a meteor. Isn't that neat? And the and one that killed the dinosaurs was probably bigger yeah. than when it landed. Yeah. Because it burnt up. Yeah, exactly. And they burn up, and yes, exactly. So, all right, so we have the asteroid belt. After the asteroid belt, what comes next? Jupiter. Jupiter. And what is one of the really interesting things about Jupiter? It is the largest planet. It is the largest planet in our solar system. And also, here's another thing. It actually influences the um, asteroids. Right, because so it's if there's so any big. asteroids coming from yeah. right here or coming from here, they'll actually most likely go to Jupiter because it has a larger amount of gravity than Earth orbit. But it could still have that one from the sun, most likely. So even with Jupiter being the largest planet, it's still a lot smaller than the sun. So remember how we said. 1.3 million Earths can fit inside of the sun. 1,300 Earths can fit inside of Jupiter. Uh-oh, we're running out of room in our solar system. After Jupiter comes... Saturn. Saturn, and Saturn is amazing. We love Saturn because it has rings, and so you can put rings around Saturn. Why is that so special? because the rings potentially give us something to look at that can tell us about how our own solar system formed. Because Saturn and Jupiter, they're giant gas bodies, which means that they are formed mostly out of gases instead of rock. And because they're surrounded, or Saturn is surrounded by the rings, we can look at them and see what kind of gravitational forces lead to the formation of moons or the destruction of moons and into the formation of little bodies, very similar to the planets forming around the sun. Also, here's So it's like a thing. mini system. Here's the thing on this memorizing it. My very educated mother just served us noodles. Us noodles. So what's you? What's the next planet after Saturn? Yeah. My very educated mother. Uranus. 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 Uranus, or you can turn it over, turn your paper over if you've already exceeded the distance. Uranus also has rings, although we don't really talk about the rings around Uranus. Uranus is also canted at an odd angle compared to the other planets. And there are a lot of questions about what happened in the solar system's early formation that led to it looking like that. Uh-oh, I actually That's okay. And then after Uranus is... Neptune. Neptune, right. The most distant gas giant in our planet. A little bit smaller. In our planet? Hmm? In our, planet. in our solar system, sorry. Does it have... Does it have a... It, it also has very faint yeah. rings. Very faint rings. Okay. Now. Welcome. Welcome. Out... Out beyond Neptune is what used to be a planet, Pluto. We love Pluto. It's an icy, icy, rocky dwarf planet out in a collection of rocky bodies that are known as the Kuiper Belt. Yeah, and there are a lot of 
a lot of little things out there, but a few that we have noticed that are on the scale of Pluto or around there in size. And Pluto would have been the old, uh, would have been the smallest planet once upon a time. Okay, draw Pluto. You're gonna do Pluto out there. And then there's the Kuiper belt. Pluto's Pluto. a little tiny dot on so Kai's page. Small. Yeah, so tiny. And it's part of another belt, like I said, the Kuiper belt. And then even beyond the Kuiper belt is the edge of our solar system, where our solar system goes out into interstellar space. And up until this point, the entire planet is pretty much on a plane. Everything, it's like spinning a plate. Everything stays on that spinning plate, going around and around and around, except for what's at the very edge of our solar system, which is, or even outside of our solar system, which is called the Oort cloud. Now, the Oort cloud is huge, and it's a massive cloud that contains our entire solar system within a giant sphere of rocks and dust and gas. And now we have a spaceship, a spacecraft, not a ship, a craft that is going out toward the Oort cloud, the Voyager craft, and the, the Voyager craft may never make it to the Oort cloud within our lifetimes, within your lifetime even. It's gonna, it, the Oort cloud is so far away, it's gonna take several lifetimes to reach it. Which is pretty mind boggling, right? It's already been a few lifetimes. Yeah, so let's talk about how far away things are, right? So now we've got kind of an idea and I'm looking at, at Kai's picture here of the solar system. And you know, everything's out in the right order. But if you think about where things are, you know, on this paper, everything's pretty close together, right? Everything is close together. So let's talk about space distances. You wanna talk about space distances? So in space, we use measurements known as astronomical units, especially specifically in our solar system. It makes it easier to think about how far away things are. Do you know how, uh, how far the Earth is from the sun? One astronomical unit? Yes. <laughs> so the Earth is, we say the, di the distance between the sun and Earth is one astronomical unit. That's 93 million miles. 93 million miles, it's a very, very long way. I don't even have that many miles in my car. <laughs> no, most of us don't. Most, most of us will not have traveled so that distance. Some of us will distance. have such a fancy, somebody has such a fancy car, like, I have 93 million miles in my car for a school gas tank. Yeah, so, I have this tape measure. Now, at home, what I want you to do is, if you have a tape measure, get a tape measure. If you have a piece of string, get some string. Use something that can be a measuring stick to give you a measure of distance, okay? Now, Kai, we're gonna start with one astronomical unit, and how far do we want that to be? Do we want it to be, let's start with one inch, do you think, on this tape measure? I want you to hold onto that end right there, okay? So we're gonna start, let's hold it up to the camera really close. So we're gonna start that little tiny bit of the tape measure between here and here. We're gonna pretend, here and here. We're gonna pretend that is one astronomical unit. And that's the distance between, no, I'm gonna hold the end, you hold this. I've got it, yeah. So that's the distance between the sun, the center of the sun and the earth. Okay, if we were traveling to Mars, the distance between earth and Mars is half of an astronomical unit. So let's let's move it a half. So, oh, that little tiny bit, yep. Out there to that half. We just moved half an inch. So now we're at an inch and a half and we're out at Mars. Okay, let's go back to your picture. That's right, so now we're at Mars. Oh, we gotta pass through the asteroid belt to get even further out. You ready to pass through the asteroid belt? The asteroid belt is between three to five astronomical units. So 
away from the sun. So that is going to be, let's move two. So one, two, and then we'll go a little bit further to get to the edge of the, get to the edge of the asteroid belt. Okay, look how far we're going already. We've gone to the edge of the asteroid belt. Now we need to get to Jupiter, which is like just a little bit past the edge of the asteroid belt. Jupiter is 5.2. So, whoop. okay. So that's point two. Yeah, so now we're at Jupiter. Ready to go to Saturn? Saturn is nine astronomical units. So now let's add, we're getting, we have to add, because we're at five and a half, we need, or 5.2, we need to go, how many more? How many more do we have to go to get to nine? Know. Nine and a half. Four and a half, so go, count four. One, two, three, four. Okay, so now we are at Saturn. Hold it up so everyone can see. This is the distance between the sun and Saturn. Okay, now we're gonna go, we are going to head out to Uranus. You ready to go to Uranus? That is at 19 astronomical units. So now, right now we're at nine and a half. So we need to go 10 astronomical units. Let's count 10 more inches. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, we're at Uranus. That's pretty far out there. Are you ready to go to Neptune? Yeah. You might have to get up and start walking that way, Kai, because we're at, we have to go to 30 now. So right now we're at 19 astronomical units. Now we need to go another 11 units to 30. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, stop pulling. 10, here we go. Oh, excuse me, I had to sneeze, allergy time. Okay, we're now at Neptune, which is 30 astronomical units away from the sun. Do you wanna to go to Pluto? Pluto, which is at the edge of the Kuiper Belt, 39. So now you have to go nine more astronomical units. Ready? Yep. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. Hold it out. Hold it out there. There we go. Okay. Kai is going off stage. Go that way. Go back toward the. There we go. There we go. Now we can see you better. Great. Look at how far. Kai is, Kai is at Pluto right now. Where are you? Do you have Pluto? Okay, the next step that we're going to take is we're going to go to the Kuiper Belt because the Kuiper Belt is also very exciting. So now we have to go 50 astronomical units away. Are you ready? It's at 30. It's at, we're at 39 right now. So go that way. And now we have to go 50. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. That's up. Okay, you're at the Kuiper Belt. All right, we made it to the Kuiper Belt. You're all the way out there. Um, no, I could not. I don't think so. So the next thing that we want to go to is we want to head out to the edge of the solar system, interstellar space. Well, to get there, you have to double this distance. We have to go to 100 astronomical units. Ready? Yep. Okay. Keep going. Going. Okay, stop! Kai is at the edge of the solar system. <laughs> no, Kai's at the edge of the solar I system. <laughs> okay, Kai's in outer space and he can't breathe, so he's dead. But um, 
to finish this all up, I just want to let you know, as the lawnmowers get going outside, mm, perfect timing, Yeah. that if you wanted to head out to the Oort Cloud, you would have to go 1,000 astronomical units to leave the soul to get into the Oort Cloud. 1,000, and my tape measure isn't even long enough to do that. Our solar system- you can't even go one. Our solar system is huge. So if you want to, I'm gonna set you a project to do, which is to build a solar system in your house. You can use little balls of puff balls. See, I've got puff balls here. You can use them in different sizes. We've got little different sizes to be different planets. And you can use your ruler or your uh, measuring tape to be able to measure out the size of the universe in astronomical units. And you can travel through the solar system in your imagination. <laughs> All right, Fab Labbers, this was a lot of fun. And I hope you had a lot of fun playing in the solar system and getting an idea of exactly how big space is. It's big. This big, bigger than this. Uh, much bigger than this. This is this is approximately to scale, right? Our solar system is massive, 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 massive. Bigger than the moon, bigger than all of us, and we're just a piece of it all. Thank you for letting us join the Fab Lab today, and Lizzie, it was so fun. Bye. As always, we're gonna close up the day, digital daycare, right here in the Fab Lab Library, where I'm going to read to you from one of my favorite new or super old books. In this case, we're talking about A Wrinkle in Time. This is one of my favorite books as a kid. And on Friday, we started to read chapter two called Mrs. Who, and now we're gonna finish up this chapter. Now, if you remember, we met Meg and she got into a little bit of trouble at school, had a little conversation with her uh, principal, Mr. Jenkins, and now she's home. Okay, we're gonna pick up and finish out this chapter. When Meg got home from school, her mother was in the lab. The twins were at Little League and Charles Wallace, the kitten and Fort, her dog, were waiting for her. Fort jumped up, put his front paws on her shoulders and gave her a kiss and the kitten rushed to his empty saucer and meowed really loud. Come on, Charles Wallace said, let's go. Where, asked Meg. I'm hungry, Charles. I don't wanna go anywhere till I've had something to eat. She was still sore from the interview with Mr. Jenkins and her voice sounded cross. Charles Wallace looked at her thoughtfully as she went to the refrigerator and gave the kitten some milk and then drank a mug full herself. He handed her a paper bag. Here's a sandwich, some cookies and an apple. I thought we'd better go see Mrs. What's it. Oh golly, Meg said. Why, Charles? You're still uneasy about her, aren't you? Charles said. Well, yes. Don't be. She's all right, I promise you. She's on our side. How do you know? Meg, he said impatiently, I know. But why should we go and see her now? I want to find out more about this Tesseract thing. Don't you? Didn't you see how upset mother, how upset, how it upset mother? 
You know when mother can't control. You know when mother can't control the way she feels. When she lets us see she's upset, then it's something big. Meg thought for a moment. Okay, let's go. But let's take Fort with us. Well, of course, he needs the exercise. They set off, Fort rushing ahead, then doubling back to the two children, then leaping off again. The Murrays lived about four miles out of the village. Behind the house was, was a pine woods, and it was through this that Charles Wallace took Meg. Charles, you know she's going to get in, get in awful trouble, Mrs. What's it, I mean, if they find out she's broken into that haunted house and taking Mrs. Buncombe, Buncombe's sheets and everything, that they could send her to jail. One of the reasons I want to go over this afternoon is to warn her. Them? I told you she was there with her two friends. I'm not even sure it was Mrs. What's it herself who took the sheets, though I wouldn't put it past her. But what would she want all those sheets for? I intend to ask her, Charles Wallace said, and to them, excuse me, and to tell them they'd better be more careful. I don't really think they'll let anybody find them, but I just thought we ought to mention the possibil possibility. Sometimes during vacations, some of the boys go out there looking for thrills, but I don't think anybody's apt to, apt to right now, what with basketball and everything. They walked in silence for a moment through the fragrant woods, the rusty pine needles gentle under their feet. Up, up above them, the wind made music in the branches. Charles Wallace slipped his hand confidently in Meg's and the sweet little boy gesture warmed her so that she felt the tense knot inside her begin to loosen. Charles loves me at any rate, she thought. School's awful again today, huh? He asked after a while. Yes, I got to see Mr. Jenkins. He made snide remarks about father. Charles Wallace nodded sagely. I know. How do you know? Charles Wallace shook his head. I can't quite explain. You tell me that's all. But I never say anything. You just seem to know. Everything about you tells me, Charles said. How about the twins, Meg asked. How do you know about them, too? I suppose I could if I wanted to, if they needed me. But it's sort of tiring, so I just concentrate on you and mother. Charles Wallace looked troubled. I don't think it's that. It's being able to understand a sort of language. Like sometimes if I concentrate very hard, I can understand the wind talking with the trees. You tell me, you see, sort of an inadvertently. That's a good word, isn't it? I got mother to look it up in the dictionary for me this morning. I really must learn to read, except I'm afraid it will make me awfully hard in school next year if I already know things. I think it will be better if people go on thinking I'm not very bright. They won't hate me quite so much. Ahead of them, Fort started barking loudly. The warning bay that the warning bay that usually told them that a car was coming up the road or something was at the door. Somebody's here, Charles Wallace said sharply. Somebody's hanging around the house. Come on. He started to run, his short legs straining. At the edge of the woods, Fort stood in a front, stood in front of a boy barking furiously. As they came panting up, the boy said, for crying out loud, call off your dog. Who is he? Charles Wallace, Charles, Charles Wallace asked Meg. Calvin O'Keefe. He's in regional, but he's older than I am. He's a big bug. It's all right, fella. I'm not going to hurt you, the boy said to Fort. Sit, Fort, Charles Wallace commanded, and Fort 
dropped to his dropped to his hinds in front of the boy, a low growl still pulsing in his throat. Okay. Charles Wallace put his hand on his hips. Now tell us what you're doing here. I might ask the same of you, the boy said with some indignation. Aren't you two, aren't you two, aren't you two of the Murray's kids? This isn't your property, is it? He started to move, but Fort's growl grew louder and he stopped. Tell me, tell me about him, Meg, Charles Wallace demanded. What would I know about him? Meg asked. He's a couple of grades above me and he's on the basketball team. Just because I'm tall, Calvin said with a little embarrassment. Tall he certainly was and skinny. His bony wrists stuck out of his sleeves of his blue sweater. His worn corduroy trousers were three inches too short. He had orange hair that needed cutting and appropriate freckles to go with it. His eyes were oddly bright blue. Tell us, what are you doing here? Charles Wallace said. What is this, the third degree? Aren't you the one who's supposed to be, aren't you the one who's supposed to be the moron? Meg flashed with rage, but Charles Wallace answered placidly, that's right. If you want me to call my dog off, you'd better give in. Most peculiar moron I've ever met, Calvin said. I just came to get away from my family. Charles Wallace nodded. What kind of family? They all have runny noses. I'm third from the top of 11 kids. I'm a sport. At that, Charles Wallace grinned widely. So am I. I didn't mean like in basketball, Calvin said. Neither do I. I mean like in biology, Calvin said suspiciously. I change in gene, Charles Wallace quoted, resulting in the appearance of the offspring of a character which is not present at his parents' time, but which is potentially transmittable to its offspring. What gives around here, Calvin asked. I was told you couldn't talk. Thinking I'm a moron gives people something to feel smug about, Charles Wallace said. Why shouldn't I disillusion them? How old are you, Cal? 14. What grade? Junior. 11th. I'm bright. Listen, did anybody ask you to come here this afternoon? Charles Wallace, holding Fort by the collar, looked at Calvin suspiciously. What do you mean, asked? Calvin shrugged. You still don't trust me, do you? I don't distrust you, Charles Wallace said. Do you want to tell me why you're here then? Fort and Meg and I decided to go for a walk. We often do in the afternoon. Calvin dug his hands down in his pockets. You're holding out on me. Okay, old sport, Calvin said. Oh, so are you. So are you, Calvin, Charles Wallace said. Okay, old sport, Calvin said. I'll tell you this much. Sometimes I get a feeling about things. You might call it a compulsion. Do you know what a compulsion is? Constraint, obligation, because one is compelled. Not a very good definition, but it's the concise Oxford. Okay, okay, Calvin sighed. I must remember I'm preconditioned to my concept of your mentality. Meg sat out on the coarse grass at the edge of the woods. Fort gently twisted his collar out of Charles Wallace's hand and came over to Meg lying down beside her and putting his head on her lap. Calvin tried to polite, Calvin tried now politely to direct his words toward Meg as well as Charles Wallace. When I get this feeling, this compulsion, I always do what it tells me. I can't explain where it comes from or how I get it. And it doesn't happen very often, but I obey it. And this afternoon, I had a feeling that I must come over to the haunted house. That's all I know, kid. I'm not holding anything back. Maybe it's because I'm supposed to meet you here. You tell me. 
Charles Wallace looked at Calvin probingly for a moment. Then an almost glazed look came into his eye and he seemed to be thinking at him. Calvin stood very still and waited. At last, Charles Wallace said, okay, I believe you, but I can't tell you. I think I'd like to trust you. Maybe you'd better come home with us and have dinner. Well, sure, but what would your mother say to that? Calvin asked. She'd be delighted. Mother's all right. She's not one of us, but she's all right. What about you, Meg? Meg has it tough, Charles Wallace interrupted. She's not really one thing or the other. What do you mean, one of us, Meg demanded. What do you mean I'm not one thing or the other? Now, now, Meg, Charles Wallace said, slowly. I'll tell you about it later. He looked at Calvin, then seemed to make a quick decision. Okay, let's take him to meet Mrs. What's it. If he's not okay, she'll know. He started off on his short legs toward the dilapidated old house. The haunted house was half in the wood, half in the shadows of the clump of elms in which it stood. The elms were almost bare now, and the ground almost bare now, and the ground around the house was yellow with damp leaves. The late afternoon light had a greenish cast, which blank, which the blank windows reflected in a sinister way. An unhinged shutter thumped. Something else creaked. Meg did not wonder what the house had a reputation for being haunted. A board of a board was a board was a board was nailed across the front door, but Charles Wallace led them around the way to the back. The door there appeared to be nailed shut, nailed shut too, but Charles Wallace knocked and the door swung slowly outward, creaking on rusty hinges. Up in one of the elms, an old black crow gave a raucous cry and a woodpecker went into, went into a wild rat-a-tat-tat. A large gray rat scuttled across the corner of the house and Meg let out a stifled shriek. They get a lot of fun out of t using all these typical props, Charles Wallace said in a reassuring voice. Come on, follow me. Calvin put a strong hand on Meg's elbow and Fort pressed against her leg. Happiness at their concern was so strong in her in her that her panic fled, and she followed Charles Wallace into the dark recesses of the house without fear. They entered into a sort of kitchen. There was a huge fireplace with a big black pot hanging over a fiery, over a merry fire. Why had there been no smoke visible from the chimney? Something in the pot was bubbling and it smelled more like one of Mrs. Murray's chemical messes than something to eat. In a dilapidated Boston rocker sat a plump little woman. She wasn't Mrs. Wetzit, so she must, Meg decided, be one of Mrs. Wetzit's two friends. She wore enormous spectacles, twice as thick and twice as large as Meg's and she was sewing busily with rapidly jabbing stitches on a sheet. Several other sheets lay on the dusty floor. Charles Wallace went up to her. I really don't think you ought to have taken Mrs. Buncombe's sheets without consulting me, he said, as cross and bossy as a very little boy can be. What on earth would you do that for? The plump little woman beamed at him while Ch why Charlesy, my pet, something in French I can't pronounce, French Pascal, the heart is its reason, where of reason knows nothing. But that's not appropriate at all, Charles said crossly. Your mother would find it so. A smile seemed to gleam across the roundness of the spectacles. I am not talking about my mother's feelings about my father's, Charles Wallace scolded. 
I'm talking about Mrs. Buncombe's sheets. The little woman sighed. The enormous glasses caught the light again and shone like an owl's eyes. In case we need ghosts, of course, she said. I should think you'd have guessed. If we have to frighten anybody away, anybody away, what's it thought we ought to do it appropriately? That's why it's so much fun to stay in a haunted house. But we really didn't mean to, you know, steal the sheets. Something in German, something in English, as I was saying. But Charles Wallace held up his hand in a, in a, in a gesture. Mrs. Who, do you know this boy? Calvin bowed. Good afternoon, ma'am. I didn't quite catch your name. Mrs. Who will do, she said. He wasn't my idea, Charlesy, but I think he's a good one. Where's Mrs. What's it? Charles asked. She's busy. I'm getting, it's getting near time, Charlesy. It's getting near time, Charlesy. It's getting near time. Something Seneca said in a language I can't pronounce. Nothing deters a good man from doing what is honorable. And he's a very good man, Charlesy, darling. But right now, he needs our help. Who? Meg demanded. And little Megsy, lovely to meet you, sweetheart. Your father, of course. Now, go home, loves. It's time, it, the time is not yet right. But don't worry, we won't go without you. Get plenty of food and plenty of rest. Rest, feed Calvin. Now, off with you. Je suis, something in Latin, of course. Faith is a, faith is the sister of justice. Trust in us. Now, shoo. And she fluttered up from her chair and pushed them out the door with a surprising amount of power. Charles, Meg said, I don't understand. Charles took her by the hand and dragged her away from the house. Fort ran on ahead and Calvin was close behind them. No, he said, I don't either, not quite. I'll tell you what I know as soon as I can. But for now, but, but you saw Fort, didn't you? Not a growl, not a quiver just as though they weren't anything strange at all. So you know it's okay. Look, do me a favor, the both of you. Let's not talk about it until we've had something to eat. I need fuel so I can sort through things and assimilate them properly. Lead on, moron, Calvin cried gaily. I've never seen your house, and I have the funniest feeling that for the first time in my life, I'm going home. That's the end of chapter two of A Wrinkle in Time. That concludes our very first of the week episode of Digital Daycare. I do hope I'll see you tomorrow. Please make sure you invite your friends and meet me here tomorrow on Facebook slash the Fab Lab HQ. I can't wait to see you tomorrow and whatever we've got in store for you then. See ya. <laughs>